Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 115 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. Thrilled that you are here with me today. Today, I am interviewing Jim Heskett, and he's a treat and fun, and the man knows how to get things done. Um, he manages to juggle, as he will tell you about, mm, doing all the things and producing books. So I know that you're going to enjoy the interview. So stay tuned for that. Uh, just a little update for from around here, I'm recording this on December 27th, 2018, which means that we are looking smack dab at the end of the year, which uh, you know I love because I love to start a new year. There's no mistakes in it yet. Uh, we haven't screwed it up. We can still dream really big. And um, so I love coming into this time of year. I am wrapping up a couple of projects. I am working on my... Um, first Patreon essay for the new book, which is exciting. That'll be coming out before the end of the month. And I am also <laughs> procrastinating on doing the entering the copy edits for the last romance as soon as I do that as soon as I enter the changes and accept the changes the copy editor already made, um, then I will be able to upload it and sell it. I'm just dragging my heels because it does not have that much interest for me. But um, I do want to mention a tool, and I'll try to remember to put a link in the show notes. Uh, I found from a listener reader this site called heartbreathings.com and um, it's pretty fabulous and it's run by a writer who is pretty prolific uh, fiction wise named Sarah Cannon and she is a delight. I have a goal of getting her on the show because she is really inspiring. I've been watching her videos on YouTube um, and she has this thing and I'll flash an image at the camera right now in case you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. But it's this uh, calendar of planning for writing and something about her language and how she talks about it really kind of inspired me. So I actually did look ahead to the whole year and I crossed out the days I'm not going to work. Um, and I know what those are. I, I try not to write on weekends. I try to spend that with family and friends. Um, I know the days in which I'm going to be out of town at conferences or teaching. Um, I'm going on a meditation retreat later this, I guess, in January, in just a few weeks. Excited about that. But I cross out all the days I'm not going to write. And her approach is just kind of to look at it realistically instead of, yeah, I know that I can write a book in two months. Um, pretty comfortably. But when you look at a calendar two months, that's never actually what you have. There's There are always days that you lose. You know, I have to um, work around things like migraines and then recovery from migraines. That's just a part of who I am. And I need to work on that. So I've actually been looking at a real realistic calendar for the year. So I would I thought I might mention that to you. If you go to heartbreathings.com, um, it's one of the posts in there, one of a, a recent post for the 2019 planning calendar. And if you sign up for her mailing list, then she sends it to you. I thought it was a great thing to get. So I thought I would share that with you. Um, next week on the show will be my annual What I Made, How 2018 went for me financially, emotionally, all those things, but mostly financially. I like to be real transparent about money. So um, between now and then, I will have figured out what I made because I don't know what that is yet. I have a pretty good ballpark idea. And then I'll break it down and as to how I made it, where the money came from, how it felt, all of that stuff. So do tune back in. That will not be an interview show. That'll just be a solo show. So that will be something that I look forward to doing. I, I really like doing these check-ins because check-ins remind me that I need to keep working. <laughs> I always know that I need to keep working, but it's a good reminder. Um, it feels good to do these kind of things. So in Patreon news, I just want to thank Lily Johnson for editing up her pledge. It always freaks me out when you guys do that, that you actually say, not only am I pledging to help you out as a patron, but I'm going to throw a couple more bucks your way. So, um, Lily, thank you. Anybody else, you can go look at patreon.com slash Rachel if you want to find out more about that. And other than that, let's just jump right into the interview. I hope that you are spending some time thinking about how to open the door and let out 2018 and let in 2019. None of us know what's going to happen next year. Thank God, because if we did, we'd be freaked out. I'm pretty sure. So um, think about how, what you're going to change 
how you're going to do things differently, what you're going to keep the same, what you're going to treasure and honor and what you are going to punch in the snoot because it doesn't serve you anymore. Um, things like not finding time to write or writing and feeling terrible about your writing to the point that you stop doing it and get up and walk away. Um, let's throw those <laughs> traditions out and bring in some new ones like accepting yourself exactly where you are. I read something great the other day. I can't remember where it was, so I can't attribute it, but it was basically uh, lower your expectations for your writing. Just lower them all the way, all the expectations, lower them until you're writing so badly that you've met those lowered expectations because later you revise it, later you edit it. That's the fun part. So my friends, happy writing, um, happy booting 2018 out and welcoming 2019 in. And I will talk to you next year. All right. Well, today I am very, very pleased to welcome Jim Haskett to the show. Hello, Jim. Hello, Rachel. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, of course. Let me give a little introduction for you. It's a good one too. Uh, Jim Haskett was born in the wilds of Oklahoma, raised by a pack of wolves with a station wagon and a membership card to the local public swimming pool. He fell in love with writing at the age of 14 with a copy of Stephen King's The Shining. Poetry became his first outlet for teen angst, yes, then later screenplays and eventually short fiction and long fiction as a hybrid author. In between, he worked a few careers that never successfully tickled his creative toes and hasn't ever forgotten about Stephen King. You can find him huddled over a laptop at an undisclosed location in Colorado, dreaming up ways to kill beloved characters. Do you know what? I, I, I've said this before on the show, but I just discovered that Stephen King is a good writer. He's a great writer. Like, I just never knew. <laughs> yeah, some, some of them, especially the early stuff. Um, he was definitely more literary, I think, early on with stuff like... Misery. Uh, Misery is mm -hmm. quite a literary book. Um, I, I yeah, read... I think some of his later stuff, he's a little nah, oh, not, I, not I, the best. He's hit or miss these days, I think. Have you read Dumas Key? Uh, is that the one about the guy who goes to Florida? And it lives above the ocean? Um, yeah, yeah, I liked the first half of that book a lot, and then it kind of went off the rails. Oh, I loved it. Which... I loved it. It was mm. so good. And I just kept think, reading and thinking, hey, these people are on to something with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows something. So yeah. welcome. So you've got a bunch of books out. Um, it looks mm -hmm. like you have a writing process and it's a good one and it's working. So will you tell us about that, how you get the job done every day? Sure, I'd be happy to. But first, let me say about my bio. I was raised by wolves, but they were kindly wolves. Oh, they were they, they were nice. good wolves. Well, they took you to the local swimming pool, so <laughs> they were they were pretty good. Yeah, they couldn't <laughs> have been half bad if they took me to, to go swimming in the summertime. Um, <clears throat> but my writing process, I'm a fast drafter. Um, Excellent. That's that my that defines way. a lot of what I do. Uh, I know a lot of people. Um, a lot of people talk about how they will get a first draft out and then cut 10 or 15 percent uh, some standard number that that of, of blab that they cut out where i'm very much the opposite my first drafts are more like zero drafts and they're all very short um so what i do what i like to do um is start with a reasonable outline where um i know beginning middle and end and i've got a few words down for every scene but I still allow myself a little bit of room to grow uh, in the outline. Like there'll be some outline that my scene might say big effing action sequence right here. Um, or it might say something like the, in this scene, the villain takes the heroine hostage. And so I'll know, uh, I'll know what, what each person in the scene wants and I know where the scene's going to end up, but I don't know how I'm going to accomplish that thing. Um, so that's where the fun of it comes. But I, I don't pants, um, uh, because I'm too scared of writing myself into a corner, which is the danger uh, and, of pantsing. I think that's the biggest, yeah, and, biggest danger. And because I I have such harsh deadlines for myself, um, I can't I can't allow myself to to write myself into a corner. So when I fast draft, I will skip over stuff, um, and and my drafts first draft or my zero draft usually ends up being about half as long as it will be in the final in the final cut. So when you are filling in those those like I do find it more common I think that people will cut down after a fast draft but I know some people including a couple of real good friends they write the skeleton draft really and then have to fill in. So what are you filling in when you get there? 
mostly stuff like um <clears throat> Mostly stuff like descriptions. Like mm -hmm. I don't, uh, I don't need to to say if the house is brick or stone in the first draft. I don't care. Um, and a lot of dialogue will get fluffed up in in second draft. Mm -hmm. Like basically, all my characters pretty much sound the same in first draft, unless it's unless it's a character I've written for before, and then I kind of know his or her voice already. Um, but but yeah, like basically, really all I know about my villain in the first draft is his or her motivation. Mm -hmm. And then they just kind of come out as a cardboard cutout in that first draft. And then usually during the process of writing that first draft, I'll discover things about those characters. Like like a character needs to do something later on. And then I'll say, okay, so what are the things when I go back? What am I going to need to foreshadow? What kind of hobby can I give this person? Um, like I'm just writing a, a, a story now and – and a scene kind of took a took a turn where a character strangled another character to death at the end of the uh, book. It's it's a it's a cozy mystery. No, it's a, it's a <laughs> it's a it's a, it's a sweet romance. No, it's a it's a very hardcore thriller. And so I when I'm writing the second draft now, I want to I want to lead up to that. And so I talk a lot about this character's large hands and how he has a habit of twisting newspapers as a way to relieve tension. Because when he strangles this person, it's kind of accidental. Mm. Like it just sort of he gets away from him and it just kind of happens. So I'm, I'm That's including stuff. To, yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I'm including stuff to build up to that. And so that's the kind of stuff that makes it into second draft. To like just more more of the color, more of the life, descriptions of people, places and things that that I don't that if I put that in first draft, it would just weigh me down because um, I want to get that first draft done as quickly as possible. Yes, you're preaching to the right kind of choir. <laughs> um, so, but I do want to ask, you have strict and stringent deadlines for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I know listeners will want to know, how do you make yourself adhere to them? Um, are you posting pre-orders on, are you, are, are you putting up pre-orders to make yourself get that done or... Oh, I haven't you? done that yet. Um, it that works. might be too much. It's I, too much. Let, I let believe me tell it. you it works and, it's, <laughs> and I'll never do it again. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it, but I don't know if I could handle that. No, I just I just said um, because I, I have a pretty regimented process for writing a book. I know exactly how many drafts it's going to take. I know when I need the cover done by. I know when I need the editing done by. So I'll set myself, you know, if my, if my ideal date is to have this book published on – uh, X day of Y month, I know I get my first draft done by this day and I know myself and I know my limits. And so I set my, my deadlines for each individual thing, basically just a little bit earlier than I'm comfortable with. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I know that it's pretty easy for me to get 2,500 words a day done, mm -hmm. I will set my deadline at 2,700 words a day. And then when I write 3000 words a day, it feels great. You know, um, deadlines definitely don't make me feel good, but they really do work at, at motivating me. And, That's and what, what are the guys? Oh, go on. What's that quote? Uh, um, I like deadlines. I like the sound they make as they whoosh, <laughs> they whoosh by. by. Yeah. <laughs> Douglas. Uh... Was that Douglas Adams? It was Douglas Adams. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, but but when you beat a deadline, that's a wonderful feeling, knowing that I'm gonna get, knowing that I get my project done before I even have to have it done. See, that's an interesting way to do it, and I and I'm intrigued by it because I do the opposite. You know, if I think I can write three thousand words a day easily, then I'll set my goal for two thousand, mm. because I'm always worried I'm gonna be losing days, and I always do. I always, ugh, ugh. but I, I really like that. I like that idea of pushing yourself a little bit harder. Um, so when, so when and where do you write? Do you write at home? Are you a morning writer? Um, well, I am writing at home now because I no longer have the day job. Nice. Um, yeah. I recently left that day job at the beginning of November. So I'm sort of, thank you. Thank you. I'm sort of learning the full-time writer thing because kind of for, for about four years I was publishing while also doing the commute and the day mm -hmm. job. Um, and my wife and I had a kid in 2014, so it was there was basically a whole lot of stolen time and bits and snatches that I had to learn how to write. And so now I'm now what I what I found is is um, that my day gets filled up with other stuff too. Of course, you know yeah. because I'm I'm podcasting now and I'm working more in my nonfiction brand and doing some consulting and other stuff uh, in in the cracks. Mm -hmm. So really. Um, I used to be, I was never, I've never been the kind of like wake up super early and write person. 
it sort of depends on if, um, you know, if my if my son has a nightmare and wakes up three times, I'm not getting up at five, five o'clock in the morning to write. Right. It's just all going to be gobbledygook. But um, I do my best writing probably in the late morning. I usually will wake up and do admin stuff, first of all, because um, I love my readers, but it doesn't require a whole lot of brain power to reply to fan mail. So that's usually the first thing I'll do is we wake don't up, have to make that. Yell, literary and beautiful no exactly <laughs> yeah and thanks for leaving that review hey welcome to my reader group etc cetera, etc cetera. that's and, yeah. and usually they're pretty thrilled to hear anything um so that's usually some of the first stuff i'll do or managing schedules and for blog posts and patreon posts and yada yada just all that 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 crummy admin stuff that uh doesn't require any creative thought anyway is usually what i'll get done early on in the morning and then i i'm right uh all day long if i can Good for you. God, that's awesome. Great. I'm more of a write as soon as I wake up kind of person. And then admin is later in my day. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? Um, <clears throat> my biggest challenge is probably that uh, that perpetual sort of Democles hanging over my head that uh, I'll be the constant fear that I'll be uncovered as a fraud and an imposter. Um, you know, because I have those I have these, these stretches of self-doubt where I tell myself, uh, uh, to quit that I'm never going to be as talented as mm -hmm. X I'm never going to sell as many copies as Y and really this all comes from comparing myself where I am now versus where I think I should be now and I'm instead of comparing myself now versus where I used to be or you know there's that saying about comparing my insides to other people's outsides mm -hmm. you know like when you um see another couple and you're like oh they look so happy but you don't know how much they're yelling at each other when they get home exactly um, yeah because really it's like here, here's a good example um that sometimes I, I have no idea what's going on like william goldman said nobody knows anything last last august in august of 2017 i went to the writers police academy mm -hmm. uh conference and when i came home i was so super jazzed about a book I sat down and I wrote the first draft of a, of a, of a book in like four days. It was like 10,000 words a day. Just wow. Got to get it out of me. Crazy excited about it. And I finished it and I was like, this book is awesome. You know, it was like the best thing I'd written. And then after that, I wrote a different book. And that, that second book that I wrote um, was a slog. And I was lucky to get, you know, where you, you just hate the words you're writing oh, yeah. and you have a day where if you write a thousand words, you're like, ah, oh, thank God that's over. Mm -hmm. And, and I did something that I, that I hadn't ever done before. And I haven't done since is that I was so unhappy with it. I got about 15,000 words in and I stopped and I compiled it to a Moby and I went and read it. And I don't ever do that. I don't ever recommend stopping in the mm -mm. middle of the first draft to read what you've done. But I was so unhappy with it. I was like, "This the plot doesn't make any sense. There's too many subplots. It's off the rails. I got to read it and rein it back in. And then I read over it and I was like, yeah, it's, it's okay. I think it'll work. So I finished that book and it was a slog the whole time. But the point is, when I finished that book, I put it up on Kindle Scout and it won. And it was then published by Kindle Press. And I'm, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying that the book I thought was terrible was – published by a traditional publisher and is probably my best-selling book and the book that I thought was great is just doing okay so like if you were to ask me what makes a story good or where do I get my ideas I would just probably shrug and tell you I don't know I just work here you know like I don't <laughs> That's my new favorite answer for anybody who asks me anything. I don't know. I just work here, ma'am. I just, I just work here. <laughs> what is your biggest joy in writing? Um probably finishing a book and then not having to look at it again. Oh my god. Like gosh, there was yes. A, <laughs> yes. There was a there was a Kurt Vonnegut book where he uh, um a char a character in that book was an author and she was saying if she was stuck on a, I'm probably butchering this quote. I'm sorry if anybody's read this recently. She, she was on a desert island and she could only take two things. She would bring her agent and a completed manuscript so she could hand it to the agent and say, here, I never want to see this again. <laughs> um, That's heaven. <laughs> no, but no, seriously, though, I, uh, I think my, my biggest joy is when people just tell me they enjoy my books because, uh, you know, as an author, I'm not. I'm not curing cancer, um, so if I can give people an escape from their crappy lives for a few hours, that's really, uh, that's that's really 
what makes me happy. Like I just um, have a book released today that I today? co-authored with somebody else. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, December twenty sixth. Uh, uh, that I wrote with somebody else and some of the early reviews are coming in and saying people are saying, you know, that it feels like a genuine book and because I'm writing with another person's characters mm-hmm. um, and I wrote the first draft. And so when people are leaving reviews that say, you know, it feels like a book in that series, you know, saying this feels like Ben, that feels really great because I'm writing. I'm able to, to replicate that experience that they're looking for, you know, even though it's not my character. I don't know if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, totally. You you wrote within it and you nailed it. That's awesome. Can you share a craft tip of any sort with us? Well, um, <clears throat> I could probably talk about fast drafting yes, uh, because I would suggest that everybody try it. Um, Have at you least ever done once. NaNoWriMo? I haven't because I have such uh, um, a, th- a well thought out schedule. Yeah. Well thought out, you sound smart, but I guess I would say that I have such a schedule so far in the future it doesn't fit in. that I, yeah, I, I've never gotten to a place where I can be like, okay, I'm just going to finish this up and then take November to do a completely different thing mm-hmm. because I'm definitely writing on average more than 50,000 words a month. Um, I mean, my, uh, um, in 2016, I wrote and published 325,000 words while that was when I had the day job and my son was two uh, and the dog had to get walked twice a day. <laughs> um, so I ended up writing a book about that experience. But because I write lots and lots of words and try to get them out the door as quickly as possible. And a big reason I'm able to do that is because of fast drafting. Because So many people come to fast drafting from Nano. Where did you come to it from? Did you come to fast drafting from trying it the old-fashioned slow revise as you go way or had you heard about it somewhere or no i've just always kind of been like this and part of it is is because when i'm writing um in first draft and subsequent drafts are much slower but in in first draft i'm really usually thinking like six sentences ahead yeah <laughs> i'm yeah. kind of you as, as I'm going, I'm like, okay, so if he walks into the room, oh, what if he sees the painting over there? And then I'm thinking how that's going to affect stuff three sentences later. So I'm like trying to get to that next thing because I write uh, I write thrillers. I write high adrenaline stuff. And so I'm getting crazy excited when I'm writing it. Are you, you know, typing like I, or, or dictating? I just got into dictation um, earlier this year. Mm-hmm. Actually, I got um, yeah, I got Dragon and I got a Zoom, and it was it was great when I had the day job because I had a half hour commute, mm. and so I could get you know a thousand words on the way to the job and a thousand words home, and that was an extra you know an extra two thousand twenty five hundred words, and I, I still do it a little bit. Um, What's a when Zoom? I'm, uh, Zoom is a little. I got it right here for your people. If you're listening to this podcast, go watch this on YouTube so you can see it. Uh, can you see it there? Yeah. It's just a little handheld recorder. Oh, okay. Um, it looks very, like, futuristic. Like, it can also <laughs> shoot lasers. Yeah, it might shoot lasers. I haven't checked out all the buttons on it yet. <laughs> Give it to um, your son. He'll figure it out. <laughs> but <laughs> he, probably, he probably would figure it out faster than me. Um yeah, I, I do sometimes dictate when I'm just pacing around the house just for a, like a change because I, if I get tired of sitting at my desk for two straight hours. Um, and I, I think I, I was hesitant to try it for a long time because I was worried that it would change my voice or or that I would just turn it on and not know what to say. But the the great thing about it, um, that the, uh, the Dragon software at least, is you can say a sentence and then sit there for a minute and think of what you're going to say next. And then say it, and then it all gets cut out when you transcribe it. So mm-hmm. it's, and and surprisingly, I didn't have. I took really quickly to being able to um, say the the punctuation, which I thought was going to be weird. Basically, I had like one strange session, and then after that, it felt completely normal. That's amazing. I had like one strange book, and then it felt <laughs> normal. And I still don't use it very much. I struggle with the Dragon software sometimes, but. I, yeah, yeah. I have Dragon on a Mac, and it's not great. But it's not great. You know, I mean, I, it, it used to be worse. It is better yes, now. That's true. So that's awesome. That's so cool. What is the thing in writing that you are most excited to talk and think about? Like when you get together with other writers, what's the thing you want to zoom in on? Well, right now, I think the most exciting thing going on in in my writing life is I 
joined up with this other group of writers. Like the, the book that came out today, I said it was co-authored. Well, mm-hmm. I was invited to join in with um, this expanded universe, you know, kind of how like Michael Anderley has his Cartharian Gambit universe of people writing in it. Well, I joined in a universe with uh, Nick Thacker mm-hmm. um, and Kevin Tumlinson oh, and great. some other guys. And, um, and I was invited to do that mostly because I – because I knew Kevin, you know, I knew Kevin because he stole a URL that I wanted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was the URL? It was uh, self publishing answers. Oh, that's a good one. I was going to make one. a podcast. Yeah, it was pretty good. So I was going to have a podcast called self publishing answers, but he stole it. So I, I friended him on Facebook and I said, you stole my URL. <laughs> and so we became friends. And then, so I, that's how I met Nick. And so it's, it's this group of us. There's about 15 different maybe 10 to 15 authors and mostly do our conversing in Slack. And it's really become also like a mastermind. That's awesome. um, Which is something that I hadn't experienced before. I mostly had done most of my writing and publishing uh, in a, in a silo, Mm -hmm. which is not what I would recommend. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm generally a pretty introverted person and I've, I've been to conferences before and, you know, I'll say hi to a couple people, shake a couple hands, and then I just want to go up to my hotel room after after all that and hide. Yeah, um, I'm not the kind of guy to go out to the bar and network and hand out business cards. Um, so, so this this expanded universe, this mastermind that I've joined, I've really learned a lot about the business from other people, and you know, because I don't think you get better just by talking to a mirror. Uh, you know, you have to surround yourself by people who have more experience and also people who have less experience. And so it's been a really, really eye opening experience for me being around these other authors and, and learning from them. That's so awesome. I'm always trying to tell people that they need the community, no matter what we think. Um, I wrote in a silo for my first couple of years and then my community suddenly expanded and everything changed. That's when I really mm-hmm. started learning. And that's when I really started figuring out what this whole business was about. And it is true. Um, you know, that data, the uh, data guy author earnings report a couple of years ago sh- proves that writers who network make more money mm. because you know who to reach out to, to ask questions. You know, we, we know these things. And mm. so we don't do it for that, but it's, it's a nice benefit. So mm-hmm. what is, what's the best book you've read recently and why did you love it? Well, the probably the book I'm reading right now, um, and I'm about halfway through it, so no spoilers, but I'm finally getting around to reading The Firm by John Grisham. Oh my gosh, I read it when it came out, and I remember I was knocked out. Yeah, I know. It's like it's pr- probably like 20 years old by yeah. now. I don't, I don't even think they have cell phones in this book. Um, <laughs> That's right. They, w- they wouldn't. Yeah, you're right. So it, it feels ancient. Mm-hmm. But but the thing is, I'm, I'm a... Um, I'm a thriller author, but I'm kind of kind of naughty in that I've never really liked reading thriller books. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like thriller stories. I, I how do I explain this? I like thrilling stories, but I found a lot of the time that in thrillers the characters are so wooden that I can't relate um, because I don't like Jack Reacher. I mean, some of the the plots are interesting, but I just don't like Jack as a character. And for me, if you don't hook me with a character by the end of chapter one, I'm not invested. You know, like to get me interested, you have to give me a character that I care about. You have to give her a goal that I care about. And you have to make me worry that she's not going to accomplish that goal. Absolutely. If you can do all those things in the first couple chapters, then I'm on board. Um, but I really wanted to to, to commit um, to studying more thrillers. And, you know, there are definitely thrillers that I like. Um and since I've been reading The Firm, this was great. I'm like halfway through, so no spoilers, please. Um, but he, John Grisham hooked me in the first chapter. He made me care about the character by, I mean, kind of this, he's this lawyer, which, which is difficult because I don't really like legal thrillers. I've attempted many and I couldn't ever finish one. But this one I actually like because he made me care about his main character in the first chapter. The guy is kind of a hard luck story. And so that made me it made him sympathetic to me. So do you that's think it'll affect reading. your writing as you go forward? Knowing that? Um, I'm always just trying to study the tropes of the genre. Um, because I don't really feel like my writing got good until I really learned what the thriller tropes were. Yeah. I feel like my first few books, I just sort of threw everything threw the spaghetti against the fridge to see if it would stick. Until I until I really understood that in a thriller, you'd need a ticking clock. 
you need to have a villain who's more powerful than the hero and you need to have the villain get the upper hand you know there's all these different elements that you need to have in a thriller that that people expect and if they don't if if readers don't find those tropes then they there's they're just going to feel like there's something just a little bit off with the book like it just didn't quite mm-hmm. meet their expectations and you know your average reader probably can't say well, it was because you didn't have a scene where the hero was at the mercy of the villain, but exactly. That's or in this what... police procedural, you have to have the mor- the, the 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 mortuary autopsy scene. You know, where yeah, where the... did you where did you find this stuff out? Um, a lot of it I learned from the Story Grid. Yeah, yeah. Um, I found that Story Grid book. I read that actually. Your uh, other podcast host Jay Thorne turned me on to the Story Grid. Of course, he's the Story Grid guy. Yep. Aside from the actual story grid guy, Sean Coyne, <laughs> Jay, is, Jay is a pretty big proponent of the story grid. Um, he turned me on to it maybe like three years ago because um, you know what? Actually, when I said that this is the first – the book that released today was the first book I co-authored, that's not true. And I'm sorry, Jay. <laughs> so if I he's forgot. listening, <laughs> he's like, you ass. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a book with Jay Thorne about two years ago. I'm sorry, Jay. I completely forgot about it. I wrote it his American Demon Hunter's World. That's why I know um, your name so well. That's that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote American Demon Hunter's Denver, which for me was just fun because I wanted to do a story in Denver that took – because you, I, I, you, you think Denver and you think big picturesque mountains. And so I set the entire – story inside a restaurant because I thought that would be fun. I just, it was just amusing to me. Um, But what were we talking about? Story grid. Yeah. um, So really it was just recommitting to reading and learning how different uh, um, authors put a twist on the trope um, because that's really what I think what readers love is when you can do a trope like in a murder mystery, a dead body at the end of chapter one, but you just put a little twist on it. Like, Mm -hmm. Nothing comes to mind immediately, but if you can just put a little twist, like give them what they're expecting, but put a tiny little twist on it so that it still feels fresh. Yeah. I think that's yeah. what makes people really get into a book. That's And that, as, a, as a reader, that's what pulls me in and makes me not want to get up off the couch. That's when right. I'm going to stay there. Yeah. Right. So speaking of writing and all of this, I know that. Um, so what would you like to tell us about right now? You ha- tell us about this nonfiction side that you're working on and your podcast or, or the newest book or whatever you would like. Sure. My nonfiction stuff uh, is called it's all under the brand of The Juggling Author. And that's at thejugglingauthor.com. And it's mostly focused on time management for authors. Uh, because I had to learn how to become really good at managing my time, you know, with a, a day job and a, and a toddler and all the other stuff that I had to do and the dog, that the very good boy dog who needed at least two or three walks a day. So I had to become great at learning how to put out a lot of fiction. So I developed all that fast drafting and that time management method. And so now I've started a podcast that's called The Juggling Author Podcast where I, I do time management stuff and I talk a little bit about marketing and a little bit about craft and a, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, so that that you can get that on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, because you can do podcasts on Spotify now, which is kind of cool. It is really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the Juggling Author. There's there, there's a book too. There's the book is called The Juggling Author, and the website's The Juggling Author, and also the name of the podcast because I <laughs> managed to get all those URLs, and Kevin didn't steal these from me this time. <laughs> And you're thinking about brand ahead of time instead of afterwards, which is the way way a lot of us do it. Well, it has been a treat to have you on here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking about your process. And and I'm looking forward to reading The Juggling Author because I am addicted to things about time tracking and time Mm. orderliness and trying to wring more out of our time because I feel like I, I feel like I'm good at it, but I'm always letting some of that sand slip through. So... And thank you so much for having me. This has been really great. Of course. Well, take care and happy writing to you. And happy writing to you. Thanks. Bye, Jim.